Devin Funches is out. That's bad. So I don't have um, time to do the whole thing. I've got several concerns here. Um, I understand not a lot of Packer fans are excited about Devin Funches anyway, so, you know, what's the big deal? Um, Alan Lazard's better anyways, which I don't know that that's necessarily true, but we'll be all right, right? You know, we don't necessarily need him. Um, my biggest issue is the massive amount of people who are choosing not to play. And I, I don't know exactly how things are structured, but I saw a football player explain why everybody's opting out, and it's terrifying me. Maybe he said it wrong, maybe I'm understanding it wrong. But his explanation was that if you opt out, you get your 150 or 350, depending on your classification, and then the salary gets carried over into next year which i don't understand that to begin with what if i don't want you next year right i mean i we signed devin funches to a one-year contract so he's just guaranteed a contract next year i don't i don't get how that works um beyond that the issue is if you don't opt out apparently and the season is canceled halfway through your money is just gone So the NFL, when they negotiated this, assuming this is true, did a terrible job because they found a massive loophole that's not only a loophole that can protect your money by choosing not to play, but it's irresponsible to choose to play. You're getting paid to not play. You're guaranteed your money next year. And if you don't play, you can lose all your money. It's stupid to not opt out. I made a joke on the podcast also about how the um, Patriots are tanking. Uh, Since then, like four more guys have dropped out, and now that's become a widespread theory that, um, you know, the the Patriots are tanking. And somebody kind of came at me and was like, come on, you're being ridiculous. And, And granted, it's ridiculous because I don't think Bill Belichick is orchestrating this and saying, hey, let's pretend you're really scared because your wife is sick and then, you know, whatever. But it's not ridiculous, because this season doesn't matter. This season is a giant asterisk next to it. If you win the Super Bowl, you're not, it's not even, we shouldn't even call it the Super Bowl, it's the COVID Bowl. And the more people opt out, and the more things seem like there's not going to be a season, and the more things become ridiculous, the more it doesn't matter, the more people want to opt out, the more people find out, hey, this little loophole... <sighs> so anyways, I'm, I'm nervous about that. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot of people are choosing to opt out. And again, if what I had heard is true, it seems ridiculous not to. Now granted, you're a year older and you have a shortened lifespan as it is. And I don't know all the details. Again, it doesn't seem realistic to me that people should be guaranteed their contract next year when I didn't sign you next year. Right? There's a different salary cap situation next year. I don't have the same amount of money next year unless the assumption is the Packers are now let's just use the Devin Funches thing as an example let's say we don't sign him then do we just choose not to use any of that money then it'll carry over and we'll use the same money for Devin Funches next year but again maybe we don't want him maybe this was for a specific purpose to get Aaron Rodgers at this particular point in time to get us to the Super Bowl and next year I don't want him so what do I do can I get out of it or is it guaranteed money because that's the point it's supposed to be guaranteed money the, the carryover money is your guaranteed money, meaning it's safe if you carry it over. Meaning you can't lose it, meaning I have to pay it. Um, again, I'll, I'll, I'll need some clarification on that. But if that's the case, the NFL did a horrible job negotiating this. Because that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to play this year. None. Right? Forget the risks. Financially, it's dumb. I don't know. But anyways... Um, Let's get off that for a second and look at this from a different perspective. So again, getting away from the whole fear and anxiety that's building up in me, I want to look at a couple things. First of all, um, are there any free agents available? 
not really. <laughs> there's there's really um, there's really just not that many free agents available. If we look at um, the available wide receivers right now, Josh Gordon, who I don't think is even really an option. Um, Taylor Gabriel, I would be okay with table, Taylor Gabriel. I don't know if the Green Bay Packers would be interested in him. He is more of a speedster, and on top of that, he's never really been that good of a wide receiver. Um, and you can add in the whole caveat of, yeah, well, this time you'll have Aaron Rodgers. So, you you know, you get the speed and you get Aaron Rodgers. Has that ever worked? I, I've been hearing that since forever. Yeah, but if you add Aaron Rodgers, boy, oh, boy. And granted, we haven't brought in a lot of uh, wide receivers, but let's look at tight ends for a, a moment in time here. Um, how much better was Jared Cook's career here than it is, say, with the Saints? Not very. How much better was Martellus Bennett's career when he came here? Worst year of his career. Now, there was other stuff on top of it, but let's not forget the fact that before all the drama and him going full psycho because he's a little bit crazy, he was really terrible here. Let's look at Jimmy Graham, who despite falling off going to the Seahawks, um, still was dominating at least in far as insofar as touchdowns to the degree that we, we felt it was necessary to pay him $10 million a year. He comes here and he has nothing to offer. So we can make excuses, but the whole argument of, yeah, but if you just plug somebody in there with Aaron Rodgers, he's going to be elite. Okay, explain every wide receiver not named Devontae then. Right? It's, you, you can't just do that. Now, maybe they, they'll be a little bit better with Rodgers or not, but I'm, I'm not playing that game. Taylor Gabriel has never been all that great. He wasn't that good in, in Atlanta, and he wasn't that good in Chicago. I don't mind the the theory behind getting this kind of speedster, different dynamic thing, but I don't think Goot is super into that for whatever reason. Um, he is 29 years old, and um, I... Uh, I don't know that he's that good of a football player. So that that's that's kind of it. I mean, I, I'm... And that's if he even wants to play. I don't know. But um, that, I mean, the, the answer to the question is no, not really. I mean, I'm sure there are much lesser guys, undrafted free agents and whatnot, that are floating around out there. But I think we got what we got. Um, and we're just going to roll with it. The, the good news, I guess, is for guys like Reggie Begleton... Um, I know a lot. most people assume he's going to make the roster anyway because he's some kind of super stud. I was a little on the fence, and I think he was on the fence. Not not in terms of whether or not he wants to play. I think he was literally on the bubble in terms of whether or not he was going to make it. I think this makes it um, obviously much better for him because they're going to want to give him a strong opportunity to be able to make the roster. But I think we're just kind of rolling with the same crew we did last year. And, and this is only going to embolden the why didn't we get a wide receiver crew. Um as I've said before on the podcast, please check out the Packernet podcast. Um, the Packers had mentioned several times that they did want to get wide receivers. It just didn't really pan out that way. It sounds like they really liked uh, Justin Jefferson and maybe Brandon Ayuk. And then after Ayuk went is when they traded up because it's kind of like, all right, we're, we're out of guys now. We got to make a move. So they did. They mentioned that there was somebody in the second round they liked, but he didn't make it. And then I think in it had to have been the third round, right? It was in the third round they liked somebody, and I, I know who he is, but I can't think of his name right now. Uh, it's going to drive me nuts. But anyways, they said there was a guy who almost fell, and then he didn't, so they took DeGuara, which I'm glad they did. I'm excited about DeGuara. But, um, so they tried. They couldn't get anybody. But the point is, all the people who are very angry that they weren't more aggressive about wide receiver are going to feel much more vindicated now because it's, uh, it's Devontae and then what? we got to hope that, that Alan Lazard can continue what he did last year. A lot of people assume that that's just a guarantee. I don't know that it is. He played very limited snaps last year. He was good when he was in, but it's 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 limited. It was a limited sample size. Um, I don't know that Kumaro is a guarantee to make the team. Again, obviously, he's a better chance that he does. Um, but despite all the diehard allegiance to Kumaro because of what he does primarily in the preseason and maybe once a season in the regular season, he has one really big game. The guy's getting up in age. He's, what, 28 years old? Um, so you got to hope that guys like MVS do have that breakout year that some people want him to have. I don't, I'm not counting on it. I don't think it's coming. But you hope it happens. My big guy that I'm excited about that hasn't really had as many opportunities that I really hope takes a step is Equinemia St. Brown. I hope he plays. I hope he shows up. And I hope he, he really does some special stuff because somebody's going to have to have to do that. And then the, the only other caveat would be the fact that with this 
increase in scheme change because although Lafleur's first year was last year, I don't think he fully implemented it. I'm hoping this year they go all the way into it. The biggest part of that is going to be tight end. So getting Jace out in the slot, hoping he has a really big year, getting DeGuara mixed in more in that H-back role, I really think that could, could take the pressure off the need for tons of great wide receivers. Because as I've said, you know, there are a lot of really good teams that don't have elite number two wide receivers. The the idea that, you know, we're wasting Rodgers' prime because he only has one top three wide receiver in the NFL is, is a little ridiculous. Um, you know, Drew Brees now has a number two wide receiver. He didn't for a very long time. Uh, Pat Mahomes has Tyreek Hill and what? He has a, a, a tight end, right? So if we can get these tight ends going, get the run game going, you know, Alan Lazard is a, a good enough number two, right? I'm not looking for a tier one wide receiver to be number two. Just be a tier two guy. And I think guys like Alan Lazard fill that role. I think Funches would have been that guy. But, um, you know, I, I think they're going to be okay so long as those things happen. Because if we see not a scheme change, if we see the same old stuff that we saw before, where it's spread them out and just go down the field and Aaron Rodgers drops back and he's just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and forget this guy, he's only five yards down the field and I'm not throwing it to that guy, I want that guy and I hope he comes open, the guy that's triple covered down there and he's a little bit open but I don't feel like throwing it so I'm going to throw it. We can't do that anymore we got to implement this. I mean, it, it, it hastens the need for us to really grasp and implement this Matt LaFleur system because it is a quarterback-friendly system, and it is a more, what do you call it, um, more, more versatile. It's more scheme-dependent, not so much you know wide receivers having to beat their one-on-ones every time. Devonte can do it, but he's he's probably the only one that's going to be able to consistently do that. But if you if you can get Matt Lafleur to do a good job of scheming guys open by manipulating the defense, especially with tight ends and running backs, Aaron Jones out of the backfield, uh, AJ Dillon tearing people up between the tackles, um, I really think that that's going to be the biggest thing moving forward. And, and look, there are bigger hits than this. Um, you've got uh, Michael Pierce, who I, I did a video about how ridiculous Madden said Michael Pierce was their number three, so apparently that was a massive hit. But as much as I, I mocked it, and it was a downgrade, the fact is that he is a good football player. Um, he was a very, very good football player, you know, when you go back two, three, four, five years ago. Strictly a run defender, but but take him out of the equation and they've got nothing. Um, and so that, that, you know, especially with the extra cap now that Pierce is not playing. And again, I, I need to do more more digging on how exactly this all plays out or whether or not guys are even going to be spending this extra cap. Because again, if, if they're guaranteed that money next year, then you kind of just wait with the money and, and let it carry over so that you can pay them next year. But Pierce is a big hit. And then Eddie Goldman for the Chicago Bears is a pretty big hit. Um, he's obviously a number two. But again, it's it's the, the group that really makes... I mean, obviously, it's Khalil Mack that's the biggest thing in Chicago. But when you take him and Hicks and Eddie Goldman, it really is a solid combination. And uh, you take Goldman out of the mix, and it's really going to hurt their ability. And... Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. If we may pivot for a moment, I'm very excited about the fact that, assuming they play, we'll see how crazy this gets. Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, um, especially A.J. Dillon, and I, I I hate to pass the torch premature, prematurely, but I'm excited, man. He's, he's bigger than just about anybody in the NFL. He's faster than Aaron Jones. I'm excited to watch him go up against these soft defenses. The, the Detroit Lions do not have... A strong interior. Snacks is gone. Uh, the, oh, that that giant Alabama defense. The, the the guys in the middle. They still have I think Deshaun Hand or something. But the guys in the middle are gone. So they have a soft middle. Their linebackers are not good. Minneapolis, Minnesota, soft middle. Chicago, not soft middle, but softer middle. Something to get excited about, despite the bad news. Um, but you know, but my biggest concern is how far does this go? How many more people are we going to lose? And what are the implications of this going forward? And again, this is kind of an instant reaction kind of thing. I I need to dig a little bit more into what all this means. But I think we're going to be okay. And hopefully there's still some stuff we can get excited about. And the season goes on. And it still has some meaning. And it's most of the teams. And it's everybody doesn't get sick and not play. It could still be a fun season (laughs) to watch. But I'm getting a little bit nervous. Um, But anyways, we're going to be fine. We're going to make it through. Funches will be back next year. Not that it's going to matter because hopefully we're going to draft somebody that's better and it won't matter. But 
Um, it is a little bit of a blow, but I think Alan Lazard is going to be ready to step up. And again, I, I really think the scheme change that hopefully is going to fully implement this year um, is really going to help it so that we're not even going to really notice. And the Packers are just going to rip up the NFL. I, I don't even, I'm excited. Forget it. I don't care. Don't care about Funches. Let's do this. I'm going to win the NFC North. We're going to win the, we're going to win the, what is it called? Not the Super. We're going to win the COVID Bowl this year. Go Pack Go!